All right, this is uh, Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Get your King James Bible. Go to Daniel chapter 2. And keep this in mind. We just, uh, last study, we did Daniel chapter 1. And Daniel, who was dearly beloved of the Lord, was given wisdom and skillful understanding in visions and dreams. And it's going to serve him very well in this capacity. Verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, and the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. I guess Syriac is uh, the Syrian language, I suppose. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, Verse 5, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if ye show the dream and the interpretation there, thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see, the thing is gone from me. Now, what is the king saying here? Is he saying, I don't remember the dream? You know, I, I remember having a dream, but I don't remember exact the details. Or is he saying, basically, well, if you can tell me what the dream is, I will know for a certainty that you can give me the interpretation of it. Perhaps it's one of those two things. Either he doesn't remember, or he wants them to prove to them that their interpretation is the real deal. Verse 9. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. 
Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies, desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto, da uh, unto Daniel in a night vision. Ah, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. Oh, yeah. It's God that changes fall to winter, winter to spring, and spring to summer. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have dreamed and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So this little thing that we're going to be reading concerns the latter days. Uh, the modern way of saying that would be the last days. So this is for a, a time far off from the time of Nebuchadnezzar and from the time of Daniel. Now remember, we're talking about Babylon here, physical Babylon. When you get to Revelation, you're talking about mystery Babylon, which is spiritual Babylon. So... But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for these, as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass? But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that, 
that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. O thou king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The, this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer thresh threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven... The God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold." And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, forasmuch as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Forasmuch as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Ah, what was that rock? What was the stone? What was the, corner, the chief cornerstone? What was the rock? Christ. I could make a, an entire Bible study on just that alone. For as, much, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof Sure. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. 
Wow, sacrifices, huh? The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal the secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Let's read a little bit about the uh, stone. Let's go to Isaiah 28 and verse 15. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. How about Psalms 118 and verse 22? The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Oh, I love this. Acts chapter 4. Verse 10. Now, uh, Peter and them had just performed a miracle. Acts 4.10. Be it known unto you all. Ah, you didn't know Peter was a southerner, huh? Be it none, known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ... Not Yeshua HaMashiach, no. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Maybe that's why they want to use Yeshua. They don't want you to use the name of Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. How about Mark 12:10? And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? Oh, yeah. First Peter chapter 2. Seems like I did this study not long ago. Well, then again, after I've done a thousand studies, a lot of this stuff overlaps, but... Oh, well. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, 
And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is become the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous night, his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, Ephesians were the residents of Ephesus, which was a church in Greece. Okay, and speaking of Jesus, verse 18. Ephesians 2, 18. For through him, Christ, for through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Do you have any doubts that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone? I mean, right here it is. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Now that verse ties right in to Revelation 21, verse 12. You know, it talked about the, uh, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, remember? All right, so Revelation 21, 12. All right, it's talking about the uh, New Jerusalem. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates. And at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Did you notice there is no thirteenth gate for the Gentiles? Verse 13. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. 3, 6, 9, 12. There is no 13th Gentile gate. Verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And uh, if you're looking for Judas Iscariot, I think you're going to be looking for a while. I don't think you're going to find it. Verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. So... And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Isn't that what we just read in Ephesians 2.20? And are built upon the foundation, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
So, did I prove the point? I hope so. All right, Daniel 2, 45. He says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So in Daniel chapter 2, the stone is going to destroy this image, which is the four kingdoms. I should have read the verse before it, verse 44, Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Forasmuch as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now, oftentimes, maybe not always, but you, a lot of times, uh, if you're not sure, let's say there's a word or a phrase in the Bible. Let's say uh, there's a word that you want to look up. Uh, for example, iron. You know, it talks about the end time kingdom would be uh, ten toes, part of iron, part of clay. And you're like, hmm, iron. Uh, what's the, where's the first place that iron appears in the Bible? Perhaps that will give us a clue as to the meaning of the iron and part of clay. Now, let me remind you of something. Let's take a look at the clay first. Well, in Genesis 2.7, it says, And the Lord God formed, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right. Now, it says dust here, but, you know, it could, you could probably substitute clay, right? And if you want to see a uh, companion verse, turn to Job chapter 10 and verse 9. He says, Remember I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, that thou, the Lord, that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again. Job 13, 12. Your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. Ah, okay. Job 33, 6. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Huh. Here's an interesting verse. Psalms 40 and verse 2. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. What's the rock? Christ, right? Oh, yeah. He took, took David out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set his feet upon a rock and established his goings. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Jeremiah 18.6 O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. 
All right, so let's assume, well, we don't have to assume the clay is, you know, Israel. At least that's how I look at it. You know, that's what I think, I think the Bible teaches that, pretty plain, pretty clear. But what about the iron? Well, the first time iron appears in the Bible is in Genesis 4. And guess what Genesis 4 is talking about? Cain and Abel. And guess who kills Abel? Cain. Oh, yeah. So, he goes, gets married. Cain kills Abel. Cain goes, gets married, starts having kids. All right, let's, uh, everybody should know the story of Cain killing Abel. I mean, everybody should know that story. So let's go to Genesis chapter 4 and start in verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch. And he built a city, and called the name of the city after the, na the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methuselah, and Methuselah begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the, other, and the name of the other Zillah. And Adah bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. Verse 22, listen carefully. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain. I don't know if you know it, but Tubal Cain is a, one of those code words in the Masonic Lodge. I don't remember, you know, it's been a long time since I've done a study on the Masonic Lodge, but I, I do remember Tubal Cain was like a secret code word, you know. And Zilla, she also bare Tubal Cain. It's funny, Cain's name is in Tubal Cain's name, right? An instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. An instructor. So here it is. This guy is a teacher of people that work in art in brass and iron. All right, so the first time the word iron appears in the Bible, it's associated with Cain's children, Tubal Cain, for all, you know. And, and he's, he's not only a worker at it, he's an instructor. And an artificer is somebody that not only, you know, you're not talking about just a plain old blacksmith. You're talking about somebody that does art work or an artificer that's somebody that does delicate intricate art uh you know art type work with iron and brass and i'm wondering if they knew how to do steel so uh you know some people will argue and say well you know cain was Adam's uh, child, and then there's other people that say, mm -mm, nope, uh, the serpent's child. You, uh, you can pick whoever you want, but you know what? Adam, uh, Cain is never mentioned in Adam's genealogy anywhere. I find that very interesting. And the first murderer was the one that is mentioned for iron. So the iron toes with mixed with the miry clay. I find that extremely interesting. 
Very interesting. And it says they won't cleave together. So you can do with that little information whatever you wish. Uh, I've got my ideas, but, you know, you could have yours too. But uh, I find it very interesting that Cain's children were the instructors in iron. And um, the thing is, with iron, when you mix iron with carbon, for example, uh, coal or charcoal or uh, you know how to make charcoal, you just take like a hardwood like uh, oak and uh, you don't burn it to ashes, but you, you burn it until it's all black. And then you crush it up and then you throw it in with the iron and it turns into steel. Steel can be up to 10 times stronger than iron. If it wasn't for steel, we could not have modern skyscrapers. It would be impossible. You can't use cast iron and build 100-story buildings or 50-story buildings with just pig iron. They call it pig iron or cast iron. And according to Japanese legends... The Japanese have been making steel swords for, some say hundreds of years, but others say thousands of years. And according to the Japanese, the gods came down from heaven, fallen angels anyone, and taught them how to make steel swords. So did the fallen angels come down and tell them how to make steel swords? Uh, that's their legends, you know? And Japanese have been making swords for a long time, and their steel, their old steel swords are top quality to this day. Those old swords that are hundreds and hundreds of years old, they've examined them, metallurgists have examined them with modern testing methods. And they admit that it's exceptional quality. So where did they learn to do all this stuff? You know, it makes you wonder. And according to Japanese legends, the gods came down from heaven and married the women. And uh, they say that the uh, emperor of Japan is a direct descendant of the god that came down from heaven. Shades of Genesis 6, people, you know? And if you don't know what happened in Genesis 6, I got a playlist on it. And I tell you what, a lot of people choke on that. They can't handle, they can't handle Genesis 6. Uh, they want you to think that uh, godly men, the sons of God, married ungodly women, the daughters of men, so all the men were godly and all the women were wicked. And then those godly men married those ungodly women. And they had giants for children. And then God got un unhappy with them and then drowned them all. And then it happened again after the flood. The godly men married those terrible ungodly women. And they had giants like Goliath. And then God said, well, go into the land of Canaan and kill them all. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to believe that, you can, but, you know, is it a salvation thing? No, but uh, it just, you know, to me, it, that, turn, that kind of stuff turns God into a homicidal maniac. You know, instead, you know, God should have said, hey, uh, David, instead of killing Goliath here, uh, maybe you should go preach the gospel to him, tell him that, Tell him that I love him. I want him to get saved. Believe on me and believe. Be, be saved, Goliath. Uh, I don't think so. But, hey, what do I know? You know, God said, don't marry the Canaanites. Uh, Canaan, Cain, Canaanites. Huh. Canaan. Doesn't that sound like Cain? Hmm, uh, it's just a coincidence, I'm sure, right? So, yeah. 
So what does it mean, those toes, iron and clay? I'll let you figure that out for yourself. So uh, a lot of people uh, don't like my, my ideas on that particular uh, thing. So what can I tell you? All right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father, and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.